and welcome to Tuesdays with a lecture series presented by the Friends of the Georgetown Library. We're very glad that you're able to join with us as we do this presentation today. Uh, some are joining us live through Facebook and others uh, later on as we have the opportunity to be able to put this on YouTube on the uh, library's website. My name is Bob Willie, and I've had the privilege over the last several years to be the president of the Friends of the Georgetown Library. And it is a privilege uh, to work with the community and to work with the really outstanding staff uh, here at the Georgetown Library on Cleland Street. We also are blessed to have a wonderful technology team that's been making it possible throughout this past year, year and a half actually, uh, to be able to do these presentations and to keep them going even toward, uh, even through the pandemic, end of pandemic, we pray, and uh, to be able to have this available to our community and to each of you. So glad to have you join us. And in doing that, I want to thank Heather Pelham and Truman Wynn, who are our technology people behind the camera. You don't get to see them, but they are doing a fantastic job and really appreciate the work, the fine work that they've been doing. Today, for our program on Tuesdays with, we have Tuesday with Dedrick Bonds. Dedrick is a native of Georgetown, South Carolina, and has been serving the last several years as a history professor, instructor, teacher at the Georgetown School of Arts and Sciences, and also keeps extremely busy with the managing director of Winyall Auditorium. He was recently selected, years past, as one of 25 teachers as a part of the National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Teaching Institute, served as chairman of the Georgetown County Democratic Party, and a member of the inaugural class of the James E. Clyburn Political Fellows. He has his BA degree from Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, additional studies at Clark Atlanta University, also in Atlanta, and is currently very busy at work, currently being this very moment, uh, working on his MBA at Coastal Carolina University. Uh, I love a write-up that was found in one of his bios where it says, Mr. Bonds enjoys reading, cooking, music, and family time. He is a proud husband, father, son, and God-fearing community man. And I will add a good friend and a good friend of the Friends of the Georgetown Library. Both wonderful compliments, and we appreciate our relationship and our friendship. Today, uh, he is going to be presenting, Dedrick is going to be presenting, The Life and Times of Joseph Hain Rainey, an extremely important person here in the history of the city of Georgetown. And I know you will enjoy that presentation very much. If you are joining us live streaming uh, on Facebook, you'll be able to ask Dedrick questions. So if you have a question, you can type that in and let us know. And after his presentation, when he completes his presentation, we'll have a Q&A time together. Looking forward to that. Dedrick, it is an honor to have you here. We look forward to your presentation today. God bless. Thank you, man. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. It is indeed good to see faces in the building this morning. Uh, my name is Dedrick Bonds, and I have the distinct pleasure of talking about uh, our first African-American to be seated in the United States House of Representatives, a Georgetown native, Mr. Joseph Hain Rainey. But before I get to that, I am indeed thankful to Bob and our friendship and the friends of the Georgetown Library, Mr. McInvale, Councilwoman Johnson, uh, Ms. Willie. I am thankful to all of you for your friendship, especially Bob as our, this talk was supposed to have been delivered last year, uh, but COVID interrupted. And uh, being such a good friend, Bob uh, thought that he should hold this talk. And I'm appreciative of that. Um, and then lastly, certainly not least, um, I'm thankful to my ever present uh, help, my supporting cast, my team, my wife, Joy, who uh, took time to be here with me this morning. And without you, I am nothing. So I thank you. Um, we'll jump right in. Joseph Hain Rainey was born in Georgetown, South Carolina, June 21st, 1832. We are coming up on his 189th birthday in about five days. Uh, his parents were both enslaved mulattoes. His father's name was Edward Rainey Sr. 
in rare occasions, and, and please be mindful that this work is still developing. Um, this is something that has been a passion of mine for the past few years. And to get this work to full uh, maturity, it, it just isn't happening overnight. It, it is certainly a work. So it is still developing, but in rare occasions, where I have seen the use of his mother's name, uh, her name would be Grace. Grace. Edward Rainey was a barber, and by all accounts, a good barber. Rainey, Joseph Hain, uh, was trained in the profession of his father. Not just barbering, but good barbering. According to Cyril Packwood, who has written perhaps the only work on Rainey, uh, it's called Detour Bermuda Destination, U.S. House of Representatives, The Life of Joseph Rainey. Uh, his father's trade, barbering, was passed down to him, and this trade would prove to be invaluable to Joseph in later years. I uh, pause there because for me it was striking to understand the significance of a father passing something on to his son. Um, and it wasn't necessarily money, but it was the skill in how to make money how to build connections. Um, and so in this case, with Joseph Hain developing his side hustle, if you will, as a barber, um, Edward was able to first purchase his freedom and then the freedom of his family. By the time Joseph was 14 in 1846, before the Civil War, obviously, the family relocates to Charleston, South Carolina. And at this time, Joseph Hain uh, developed a pretty thriving business at the Mills Hotel in Charleston, which is roughly a block from Charleston City Hall. The name of the business was Rainey's Haircutting Salon. Yeah, <laughs> I chuckled too when I heard it. However, for Rainey and African Americans like him, freedom didn't necessarily mean free. Uh, from his childhood, Rainey was free, at least not shattered as he was at his birth. Um, according to a recent article in the Smithsonian Magazine, quote, in pre-war Charleston, Joseph Rainey occupied a relatively privileged yet precarious position. Privileged yet precarious. Here's why. He was one of about 3,400 free people of color among 20,000 white folk and 43,000 enslaved folk in the city. Their liberties were limited by law. Every free man the age of 15 was required to have a guardian to enable him to live in the city and any insolence left the African American man open to violent assault. Free blacks had to pay a tax for their freedom. Servitude was always the assumed lot of African Americans. Papers were required to move about. As I study Rainey and his character, um, his humanity is, again, constantly evolving to me. I've begun 
reimagining him from a radical perspective. Not necessarily in a demonstrative way, but just as a part of the fabric of who he was. Again, Rainey born in 1832, and by the age of 14, 1846, he moves to Charleston. And by 1850, and here I take the liberty of imposing presentism. By 1850, Rainey turns 18. 18. Think about that. What were you doing at 18? Well, in pre-war Charleston, we've already discussed that besides working, Rainey couldn't do too much. But now we're talking more about the times here. Um, around 1823, 28, before Rainey is born, we find the country on a fast crash course that takes us into 1861, or the beginning of the Civil War. And like the start of the Civil War, that starts here in South Carolina with John C. Calhoun and his theory of nullification, right? This kicks the inevitability of the Civil War in motion. And when we look at the 1850s, we understand it to be a decade of concentrated moving directly into war's path. Let's review. Rainey turns 18 in 1850. What happens, 1850? 1849 to 1850 is the Wilmot Proviso. That's dealing with California and the new states out in the West and dealing with the issue of what? Slavery. 1850, we have what? The Fugitive Slave Act. And what was the significance of that? To seize and return all African men, African-American men who would have escaped from slavery. Right? And we know from history that they had begun to take in even free men, regardless of what their papers said. 1852, we have the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin. 1854, we have the Kansas-Nebraska Act that replaced the Compromise of 1850 and said that states that were north of the just then set boundary could exercise slavery in their states through what? Popular sovereignty, the vote. And then in 1857, we have the Dred Scott case. Dred Scott a man who was enslaved, living with his slave master, obviously, in a slaveholding state, travels to a free state, and then sues for his freedom. The case eventually makes it to the United States Supreme Court, where Roger Taney is the chief justice. And he declares with the majority of the court that no black man had any rights that the country or anywhere they lived was bound to respect. 1858, we have the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And then by 1859, there's the raid on Harper's Ferry. But how I started and how I got here with going through the decade of the 1850s was by reimagining Rainey's radicalism. Well, I found that his first act <laughs> of radicalism was in chasing his beloved. Because in 1859, Rainey leaves from South Carolina, travels to Philadelphia to meet and marry Susan 
Cooper, who becomes Susan Cooper Rainey. Now, Susan was from Charleston. Like Rainey, her family was a free family. In the conversation that we were having before we started filming, I, I am led to believe that this was probably a prearranged union of some sort. Rainey was a thriving businessman in Charleston. Susan Cooper's family were free in Charleston. Census records have them by 1860, though, in Philadelphia, which is where Rainey goes to meet and marry Susan. And again, radical because the law stated at the time that if you were free in South Carolina and you left the state, you could not come back. Well, Rainey, after marrying, came back. And when he did, um, there were consequences. According to Packwood on the life of Rainey, he was threatened with imprisonment for unauthorized travel to a free state. It was due to the intervention of some of his friends that prevented the threat from being carried out. As I said in the beginning of this talk, according to Packwood, the, the trade of barbering or this tonsorial skill that Rainey possessed directly from his father was what probably saved his hide with this Charleston incident when he returned from Philadelphia. Because it was more than likely the patronage of clients who were the friends that interjected on his behalf and saved whatever threats were rising against him. But as I cl clearly stated, this was 1860. What was happening? We had already begun the shift. The climate was becoming more intense in South Carolina. Not to mention with all of the stuff that happened in the 1850s and the threat of nullification and taxes and representation and wanting to rebuild the country, South Carolina was getting a little bothered because they didn't feel things were going the way that it should have been. The threat of ending slavery was almost imminent. That time was coming. And so the final blow of the 1850s came in 1860 with the election of Abraham Lincoln. 1860, the election of Abraham Lincoln. Everyone in South Carolina knew that the end had come. And South Carolinians began to take action against it. Parties were happening throughout the streets of Charleston. Advertisements went forth that declared the union is dissolved. And by April 12, 1861, we had the beginnings of the Civil War. By 1862, according to Rainey family folklore, or tales, stories within the family, uh, Rainey had been conscripted as a steward on a blockade runner. Charleston, according to Packwood, was one of the chief ports for blockade runners between the Confederate States and Bermuda and the Bahamas. Another radical repositioning that I have settled with where Rainey is concerned was, to, was for him seeing himself in a future greater than what his present circumstances dictated. He knew that things were going to become much worse than what they were. But that was not the life he wanted for himself or 
for his wife. Rainey first, Susan following, escaped first to Nova Scotia, and then to Bermuda. While in Bermuda, Rainey, of course, worked as a barber in the city of Hamilton, the capital. According to Packwood, Rainey was now 30 years old and was described the following way. A light mulatto with regular features, bright, genial eyes, pleasant expression, a brood, clear brow, and a profusion of silky hair. He was of medium height with a graceful and easy carriage and with very small hands with which he used effectively in gesturing. Susan, his wife, also worthy of examination, maintained and owned her own business. She was a dressmaker and by all accounts a successful dressmaker who was able to partner with a fashion house in New York to bring those styles in Bermuda. Um, while the Rainies found Bermuda to be interesting, a part of that was because by 1834, slavery had ended in Bermuda. And so unlike his time in America, specifically Charleston, Rainey was able to enjoy the full freedom of life, of humanity. While also in Bermuda, Rainey also took and created opportunities to learn. Uh, it is believed that he had private tutelage. And because he and his wife had built a successful business that involved folk who were traveling back and forth, he always kept up with what was going on back at home. He always wanted to know what was going on with the course of the war. By the early fall of 1866, and I know that some of this is skipping, especially Bob, you know, because there was a smallpox uh, outbreak in Bermuda. This isn't in my notes but I, I'm looking at you and I know that you know the story. There was a, a smallpox outbreak in Bermuda and all of the blockade runners had abandoned Hamilton and they had to move to what was called St. George's uh, in Bermuda. And, and he continued working as a barber. The wife continued uh, working as a dressmaker. As a matter of fact, there is a memorial of some sort in Bermuda called Barber's Alley, where uh, Mr. Rainey cut hair all those years ago. But by the fall of 1866, with the war over and new wealth, I say new because he had already amassed wealth in Charleston, cutting hair. Um, but now in Bermuda, the same good fortune fell on him. He was able to amass wealth, um, but he still had that desire to go home. And so he and Susan set sail back to Charleston. Before leaving, though, the Rainies took out an ad in the Bermuda columnist that stated, Mr. and Mrs. J. H. Rainey take this method of expressing their thanks to the inhabitants of St. George's for the patronage bestowed upon them in their respective, can't read my own writing, <laughs> in their respective businesses. By the time the Rainies returned President Andrew Johnson had begun 
the encouragement of the return to pre-war governance. <laughs> Logic was abandoned. Truth was denied. <laughs> I'll read that line again, because I like that line. Logic was abandoned. Truth was denied. Oh, and I said to myself last night, I was not going to do this. But it just this time that we study Rainey in is so very reminiscent to our present circumstances and situations. And we see that it starts, well, it started again with South Carolinians and Calhoun not being happy in 1828 with taxes. But by 1861, this whole notion of nullification, being able uh, for the state to disassociate themselves with the union had uh, kicked in. Logic was abandoned, truth was denied. In South Carolina, the black codes were enacted. The black codes were designed to establish and regulate the domestic relations of persons of color. An example of such black codes would be a labor contract or vagrancy. Johnson adamantly felt <laughs> that it was a country just for white men. So by 1866, the Rainies have relocated to Charleston. By 1867, Rainey and his family have relocated to Georgetown, the place of his birth. When South Carolina holds its first constitutional convention in Charleston, Rainey, along with Henry Webb, a white man, and F.F. F. Miller, a black man, was the Georgetown representation. They were the delegates to the convention. The majority of the black delegates outnumbered whites for the first time by the number of 76 to 48, resulting in South Carolina's compliance to the Re Reconstruction Acts, extending suffrage to adult male citizens of whatever race, color, nationality, or previous condition. In April 1868, Rainey was elected to the South Carolina Senate. He served on the Finance Committee. In July of 1868, he was able to cast his vote ratifying the 14th Amendment, guaranteeing full citizenship and equal protection to all citizens. In 1870, Reverend B. F. Whittemore, then the representative, was accused of selling an appointment to the United States Naval Academy. And rather than dealing with expulsion, he resigned, thus creating a vacancy in South Carolina's first congressional district, at that time which included Georgetown, Ory, Marion, Williamsburg, Darlington, Chesterfield, Marlboro, Sumter, Clarendon, Kershaw, and Lancaster counties. <laughs> On Monday, December 12th, 1870, Rainey was sworn in as the first African American member of the United States House of Representatives. When the 42nd Congress convened, two other men of color joined Rainey as a part of the South Carolina delegation. Robert Benjamin, uh, excuse me, Robert DeLarge and Robert Brown Elliott. And also in 1870, a freeman, a freed man by the name of Hiram K. Revels became the first African American to be seated in the United States Senate. Rainey served in the House of Representatives from December 12, 1870 until March 3, 1879. 
His record of five terms in Congress during Reconstruction was shared with another fellow South Carolinian, Robert Smalls of Buford. By the way, let me say this to my, especially if uh, some of my friends in Buford are watching, but more importantly to our friends in Georgetown, just like Rainey's obscurity was not coincidental, our collective knowledge of him should not be coincidental either. Buford has made an entire cottage industry of the history that took place in Buford during the Reconstruction. I'm not saying that Georgetown has to follow suit, but we have some worthy history here that is not just all indigo, cotton, and rice. Just thought I'd put that out there. When Rainey retires from the house, and I use that, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm about to address it. Bob's face, his brow furrowed. He didn't really retire. A part of what was taking place in this return to pre-war glory as the redeemers saw it, was domestic terrorism at its most basic and elementary levels. Um, we saw the creation of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan for that express purpose, to shut down and I guess pun intended, nullify the 14th, the 13th and 15th, 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, all reconstruction amendments. We got the Department of Justice because of this behavior, domestic terrorism. So when Rainey is cheated out of his seat, and he even addresses that, as it being stolen. He says that he was legally elected, but he knew what the game was. So when he retires from the house, retires, air quotes, he was 46. By 55, after trying for a few federal appointments that fell unsuccessfully, he was broken in spirit and in health and died in Georgetown not too much longer after he buried his father. Um, recent research indicates that it was malaria that, what, that is what uh, caused Mr. Rainey to succumb. The Charleston News and Courier, and one of the buzzwords that I use with my students all the time is connection. So the Charleston News and Courier, or what we now know as the Post and Courier, in its obit, obituary of him, called him the most intelligent of the South Carolina Reconstruction politicians. It ended by saying Rainey would have been, or would have achieved greater distinction if he had been less honest. The stories of Rainey and Robert Smalls and the countless other African-American men that served with honor and distinction during America's chance to make right its wrongs or the reconstruction have not been kept from us coincidentally, as I said earlier. These stories of these men uh, and other patriots um, suffered great loss, we suffered great loss, at the hands of those redeeming the quest to return to pre-war glory. The real stories of horror and violence are less of political power um, and was ended up being pushed, relegated to the back. 
The whole era of Reconstruction was set as an experiment gone bad, with black voters who were not capable of making sound decisions or were not even capable of governing. It seemed as though the country was destined and determined to move from what had been considered its nadir, or its lowest point. The redeemers went on to redeem. Statues were erected all throughout the South, wishing to have those days of glory back. The Dunning School, named after William Dunning of Columbia University, took full effect. The Dunning School was literally where William Dunning trained other scholars to go out and tell a different story of what took place in the South during Reconstruction. So as we look forward and approach the 189th birthday, let's learn of his work, remember Rainey's legacy, and continue the fight for equality and for human rights. Thank you. Dedrick, thank you so very, very thank much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, don't go away. Oh, I we're going, okay. <laughs> we'll have a chance to talk together, if we may. Yes. Over a, a, a topic of interest for both of both. us. Both, yes. And uh, appreciate so much your research and all that you've done uh, in presenting this today. Thank you. Thank wonderful, you. Wonderful, wonderful presentation and a challenge. Um, I, um, a few questions. Yes. One is, you've used the phrase, and I love it, radical repositioning yes. uh, of Rainey. Uh, in a number of instances, you mentioned the one instance of going north in regards to his wife, marriage, coming back to Charleston. Mm -hmm. Other instances of that that uh, you, you could share with us about some other things within his life that are a part of that radical repositioning? There was an incident where he was in a restaurant, and you and I were talking about this mm -hmm. before we got started, and he was just looking for a beer, a glass of beer. And the manager of the restaurant literally came and picked him up by his collar without <clears throat> trying to figure out who he was, without trying to treat him with humanity and throwing him out of the restaurant. Um, he was an active part. Rainey's 10-year, nine-year tenure in the House of Representatives, half of that was spent trying to achieve civil rights legislation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of radicalism there given the fact that uh, what the country was facing, what the South was facing, and in particular what black legislators were facing during the Reconstruction era. So yeah, I saw him, uh, and those are just the two that come to mind. I knew I should have written down, there were at least two or three others, but that begins to introduce his character as someone who just did not settle for what the times dictated. Yeah, I, I thought that was radical. I still think that it is. Uh, I agree. And, and the other part, I, I'm thinking of his term in the House of Representatives, if I recall correctly, one of his committee assignments was on the Committee for Indian Affairs. Yes. And so- when First African American to serve on the uh, Indian Affairs Committee. And he was also, by default, well not by default, because there were other, other African Americans in Congress, but he was also the first African American to preside over a session of Congress. Yeah, and it's extremely important as well in yeah. terms of its history. And, and, and that Indian affairs to me is interesting in that he sees civil rights not simply as a black-white issue, but Native American issue as well, because some of the things what he's doing- What was going doing, on at the time. Yeah. Well, <laughs> prior, uh, shortly before that, but Indian removal yeah. was a big thing. Not even, again, this is a part of the times that he uh, became a man in, but Indian removal had just taken place a generation right before. So he was keenly aware of, of what was going on, not just for African Americans, not just for the Native Americans, but even at this time for the Asian Americans mm -hmm. who were here in the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Yeah. Because by the time we get to 1886, of course he is no longer in Congress, but we have the Indian Removal Act. At, not Indian removal, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Mm -hmm. So there were several incidences of 
not showing full humanity to American citizens. And, and then, my goodness, we won't even get into the Europeans that came. Mm -hmm. Irish and other ethnic groups yes, that are sir. coming in. Lebanese for us here in, yeah. in Georgetown. In Georgetown. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, you're talking about the Reconstruction Era, always one of the challenges I've seen, and, and I know this is your interest too, obviously, as a historian, is how do you get at the Reconstruction Era? How do, how do you get to the history of that, in that so much of it is being presented by, um, I don't know what category you would use, but uh, those who are sort of the winners during that period of time? How do, you, how do you get at the history to find out what really is happening during the Reconstruction Era? I would suggest starting where you are particularly if you're in the South. Investigate where you are. Investigate what took place during those years of the Reconstruction. Reconstruction started in 1865. Mm -hmm. uh, military Reconstruction ended in 1877. And there's a story involving Rainey in the Hamburg Massacre, right? You know, just a few Days ago, we were talking about the Tulsa mm -hmm. massacre, as if that were the only one that took place. There was Rosewood, not far from, I mean, not uh, in time, not far from Tulsa. But predating both Rosewood, Florida, and Tulsa, Oklahoma was Hamburg, South Carolina. The massacre that took place there, I want to say there were somewhere between four and six African Americans that were murdered during that time. Mm -hmm. There was also another incident where 66, 1866, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, a fellow colleague of Rainey's was murdered. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Rabillo writes a book about Georgetown, and it talks about the Brownfield case. Right? So now I'm going back to your previous question about the Reconstruction. It's good to, to know what has taken place in your area, era, area, during that era. Um, but now to, you know, to, to bring it full speed, yeah, just look where you are mm -hmm. and read. <laughs> read. Um, they're, they're worthy studies that have been done on, on America's Reconstruction. Um, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote extensively on the Black Reconstruction because his life was so, so long. Um, he remembered and talked about the, the change that he saw coming with the Redeemers and then wrote about Black Reconstruction scholarly and then followed up with it uh, in the 30s. And mm. so, it, it, it's out there. It's out there. It's been hidden, a lot of it, but it's now coming to light. And so we have to take the responsibility on ourselves to find out as much as we can. Including the biography of Joseph Hain Rainey and to know more about him. The only, <laughs> the only thing that has been done on Rainey in a scholarly sense is this very short book right here. This is it. And there are including the bibliography and end notes, 39 pages. That's it. Now, Rainey's life, his wife Susan's life, his brother's activism in the Colored State Convention, all of those are worthy of examination and further uh, exploration, especially Rainey's positions uh, on things as he was a member of the House, civil rights, education. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. And an article recently in, uh, in the, the Smithsonian, Smithsonian. Uh, just the beginning of this year, uh, January, February issue, I believe, of the Smithsonian, uh, an article about uh, Rainey. A so. lot of it still, though, <laughs> based here. Yeah. Um, there, there has been more access to digitized records recently where Rainey is concerned. And then the Library of Congress um, with the congressional records mm -hmm. are very helpful. In Rainey's first election, he would have been in the 42nd Congress. So you go from the 42nd to the 47th. 
And there you can find all of the documented records of Rainey on the floor of the Congress. So. Including several significant speeches that it, he makes. It, several, yeah, yeah. several, several. Yeah, a, a very active member of the, he was. Of the House of Representatives. Yeah. It, it almost makes it very plausible to understand why after having such a meaningful and impactful life that he died broken of spirit at the end. You know, no. um, here it was. He couldn't even get an appointment to work for the federal government um, and had tried more than one on more than one occasion and it just wasn't successful. And he ended up coming back to Georgetown, um, starting a mercantile business. Uh, his father was also sick, though. Mm -hmm. And so his primary reason for returning was to take care of his father. He did that, and he subsequently died a year or two after his father did. And most of his children had gone on to the Northeast, to uh, Philadelphia. Um, we were talking about Hartford, Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut area. Uh, yeah. Rainey bought a house for his family once the now he, he uh, you know, he was indeed a radical person as I as I am labeling him, but he was also a pragmatist mm -hmm. and a realist. And he was concerned for the safety of his family. And so the family's relocation to Windsor, Connecticut is what was prompted there. And then there, his wife ends up dying in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Springfield, Massachusetts. And um, you've seen the grave. Mm -hmm. So yeah. very interesting uh, life. And one that has not, unfortunately, been studied the way that some patriots of America have been. Dedrick, thank you. Thank you, sir. Very, very enlightening, very encouraging, very challenging. And very really, challenging. Yeah. And it, it's even more so for us to continue the work in the same times that we face now. Mm -hmm. And it requires the same amount of fortitude and courage that Rainey distributed or displayed then for us now. I'm going to change subjects. One of the things I mentioned is that you're working with the Winyall Auditorium. Yes. And uh, know that that's near and dear to your heart. Yes, as, it is. As, as is yes, the subject. it is. Yes, it is. Just uh, as one of the things of the friends is we really emphasize collaboration, working together, and encouraging people within the community of Georgetown. Uh, in a couple of minutes, could you share with us some of the things that are happening? A couple we, of minutes. <laughs> gladly. gladly. Um, I'm, What's happening at the Winyall Auditorium? Let me say that I see uh, two folk in here that that are very instrumental in, and have been with keeping Winyard going. Ms. Lily Jean Johnson and Dwight McInvale. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, the Winyard this weekend, as we've been coming out of COVID, my board and I tried to find ways to celebrate Georgetown coming out of COVID. And so what we came up with was uh, a free concert series uh, that we started in May, one in June, and then the other in July, and market Saturdays. We identified four Saturdays to host a market out on the lawn with live music uh, and food while the day is going on, 10 to 3 for the market. And then Saturday nights during market Saturdays, we have a concert. So this Friday, we have our second free outdoor concert. That will be True Soul. They'll be there, bring your lawn chairs. It will be on the outside, the front lawn of the Winyard Auditorium, yeah, beginning 18th, at 7. That's on Friday the 18th. That's on Friday the 18th. Got it. And then <laughs> Saturday the 19th, for those who are celebrating Juneteenth, Ashe. Uh, but uh, for us, we will be hosting a market Saturday at the Winyard Auditorium, 10 to 3. I do not remember who the artist is performing Saturday day. Sorry, I put you on the spot. That's all right. But Saturday night, Solid Gold Country uh, will be performing uh, at the auditorium. And so we're looking for this an exciting, exciting yeah. weekend ahead. And, um, you know, it's really exciting because as we all expressed when we came in here, we're in a room with more than one person. No one is wearing a mask. It's, well, one person, but we, we all, for the most part, are vaccinated. And it's exciting. We're coming out of this thing, man. We see lights at the end of the tunnel. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Dedrick, thank you. Thank you, man. And blessings in your response. Thank you very kindly. Thank you. Appreciate thank your you. presentation today thank very you. much. All right. Yeah.
and, and, and yes, you're, you're hearing applause from the eight of us who have gathered here. We were remarking before that, uh, again, appreciating so much Heather and Truman and the wonderful work they have done uh, in technology, allowing us to be able to do these presentations live streaming and also in addition to that, being able to have the, the video of that then put up on uh, YouTube. It's been great. And it's been a great year. Uh, this season-wise is the end of the 2021 20, uh, um, season of Tuesdays with. What, what a great group of people we've been able to have this year. I just go through the, the, the season as you think back. And incidentally, all these presentations are still available on YouTube, all the way from Ed Piotrowski, who was talking to us about uh, hurricanes back in October, William Connor, Gloria Bar Ford, Jim Lee, Tracy Swinton Bailey, Libby Bernadine, Paige Sawyer, Julie Warren, and today, Dedrick Bonds. What a wonderful series this has been, blessed by so many great people sharing their passions, their heart, their interest with us as we've gone through this past year. And beginning in the fall of 2021, we begin the next season. And we're excited that already our year has been confirmed. We have all of our speakers set going all the way from September through May of next year. That's 2022. Wow. Uh, thinking of all that, and moving from uh, just the technological part to actually, as we hope in September, going to live presentations with an audience. Uh, we're not sure exactly where, because part of it's going to be construction. It's going to be taking place here at the library, but someplace we're going to have a live presentation. And in the process of doing that, excited to have you all back with us once again for the fall. And putting this on your calendar already for our first presentation will be on Tuesday, September 21st. We're always the third Tuesday of the month, September 21st. Ron and Natalie Days with Johnny L. Ford on a wonderful book that they worked on together. Uh, and again, a very important part of our history here in Georgetown County, the Mackenzie Beach memories. Particularly Johnny's remembrances of that, as, as he told Ron, and also Natalie has illustrated in a beautiful book. They'll be here with us in our presentation on our first Tuesdays with the 21-22 season. October 19th, Richard Dimenstein leading a local panel on the stores of Front Street, stories of Georgetown's Jewish merchants. Again, a very important part of our history and a wonderful, interesting dimension of what we've seen and experienced here within our city. And then finally, in the fall, November 16th, uh, James Lucan, a biologist at Coastal Carolina University on outdoors in South Carolina. To Dedrick, I thank you once again for a wonderful, challenging, encouraging, interesting presentation. Uh, as we talked about before, a teaser on uh, Joseph Hain Rainey, looking forward to knowing much more and learning much more and celebrating it much more. Uh, I thank you for this presentation today. And to all of you, God bless, stay healthy and well. Thank you so much.